This is House Planning Help episode 256. Hello, I'm Ben Adam Smith, and this is the podcast for you if you're interested in self build because I'm exploring what houses we should be building in the 21st century and trying to break down the major roadblocks that may get in our way. And coming up in this session, my guest is Tom Haywood from Green Building Store. We're doing the double with them. This time, we're looking at MVHR design, how to do it well, and why that is important. First today, though, a little congratulations to the BBC, because I'm always thinking this, that we should be doing more programming around some of the issues that we have living on the planet, climate change, extinction and where we fit in, what we can be doing. And this is exactly the sort of thing that I've just seen in War on Plastic, all about single use plastic and plastics in general and how it is such a major problem. Getting that to a wider audience, explaining it is very depressing, particularly when you think you're doing the right thing with recycling and they show you a sequence of massive amounts of plastic being shipped out to Malaysia and then effectively just dumped or burnt even worse it's just oh my goodness nothing is ever easy is it so one of the nice things about this program is it's not just informing you it's also well what can you do in your own life and showing you ways that you can cut down your plastic so we've certainly taken this on board although it is amazing how much plastic there is you just take it all for granted don't you We've made quite a few steps already to reduce the plastic in our house. And then we opened the fridge and almost cried. It's just everything comes in plastic. And sometimes to save time, we don't do this all the time, but we get deliveries of groceries to the house and they just wrap everything in plastic. You think if I was in the shop doing that, I would not put a separate bag for each bread roll. It's just so easy. This plastic just, oh, I'll tell you what, dish it out here, dish it out there. And big things like when supermarkets started charging for plastic bags, that was such a good step. There must be more things like this. And as I mentioned, what we're trying to do is just refuse it to begin with, not bring it into the house. But it is challenging. So one thing I'm thinking of doing is I'm not quite sure where I'm going to do this, but I feel it's another part of eco living, sustainable living that I want to report not always saying that I get it right. And in fact, certain things that we've tried to do well, uh, nappies, that was one example of where we tried to do the right thing and washing all your own cloth nappies and stuff. It was just a nightmare, particularly before we moved into this house where it's easy to dry things. So we went back to the disposable ones. So yeah, just I'd like to document that and I'm going to find a place to do it. Also share what I feel has worked for us over the years. Things like I don't eat any fast food, trying to buy quality products where we can reduce the amount of meat we eat all the usual stuff the one that I really worry about is the flying thing because I can see tension there my wife loves holidays and uh, not saying we have massive amounts we'll probably only have one holiday this year but I don't know where the line is there and when you have a brother who lives in Sydney in Australia the other side of the world who we'd quite like to go and visit (sighs) what what do we do there anyway that's another (laughs) day Let's get to our featured interview. Over the last couple of podcasts, we've decided to zoom in on a few key aspects of high performance homes. As you make your home more airtight, your ventilation strategy is critical. So today I chat to Tom Haywood, who is the MVHR design manager at Green Building Store, where they really know their stuff. And so lots to dig into today. I started by asking Tom, though, how he came to specialise in this area. I was at uni studying architectural technology and it came to doing my dissertation and I thought I wanted to do it on something different and we'd not been taught anything in uni about efficient building, especially passive house. So when I found the green building store and I started doing a dissertation on based on passive house principles and looking into that and then I was working as an architectural technologist but it was a bit boring, it was all set standards, Jaguar Land Rover, we knew exactly what we wanted. So then I real I saw that a job had popped up at Green Building Store as an MHR designer. And I thought, well, I might give it a go and got the job. And here I am. <laughs> Let's stick with basics. Why is ventilation important? Well, uh, particularly in airtight buildings, as we start to build more airtight, there's obviously no natural ventilation coming in through trickle vents or leaky building fabric. So... Um, you then start to need to introduce some kind of mechanical ventilation to provide enough fresh air for the occupants to keep CO2 levels in the building down and prevent dangerous build-ups of volatile organic compounds and other indoor pollutants. 
So natural ventilation, um, it's something that we've lived with for quite a long time, but how does it compare to a mechanical system and when MVHR is designed well, what would you say are the differences between the two? With natural ventilation, it's quite unreliable. So on a still day, you might not get much ventilation at all. On a windy day, you'll be getting too much ventilation, resulting in cold drafts around windows. And you might get more ventilation on one side of the building where the wind's hitting than the other side. So it's quite unreliable. You can't deliver a certain amount of air to each space depending on the use. Whereas with um, with mechanical ventilation, combined with an airtight envelope, you can deliver a certain amount of air to each space depending on the uses. So a double bedroom will get more supply air than a single bedroom. And you can be quite accurate with that when you come into the commissioning process. And instead of extracting all the air and just dumping all the heat outside... It makes sense to recover the heat, as much heat as you can from the air, so that you're in turn driving your heating load down. As you get more and more airtight, at what point does it make sense to have mechanical ventilation? With passive house it's easy because you're going the whole hog, but as you increase that airtightness? Yeah, as a rough guide, when you get to around five, less than five air changes per hour, that's when you need to start introducing some kind of mechanical ventilation, whether it's MEV which is just extracting, not supplying and not recovering any heat. So as you're extracting, you're creating a negative pressure in the building, which drives air in from outside. Again, you get the problem is cold drafts and cooling of the building. So MVHR starts to make sense when you get down to three air changes per hour, because then there's not not as much cooling going on with natural ventilation coming in. So it makes sense to start recovering the heat and putting it back into the building. An MBHR is most optimal, obviously the more airtight you get, so down to passive house levels is ideal. So what is it, an MVHR machine? We know it's a fan, but it, there's more to it than that. Yeah, yeah, so you've got you've got two fans, a supply and an extract, and a heat exchanger. So as we extract air from bathrooms, shower rooms, utility rooms, kitchens, anywhere where there's stale, moist air being produced... We extract the air from there, it goes back to the heat exchanger, which is where the fans are, and the incoming air recovers the heat from that extract air, so you get a nice fresh air coming in, picking up that heat, and that is then supplied to the habitable rooms, so living rooms and bedrooms, and that air is filtered, usually through an F7 filter, so that's a pollen grade filter, so you get a nice fresh clean air supplied to the rooms. Now, what's important? What do we need to know to get MVHR right? The first thing is the design is everything. People often focus mainly on the specification of components, which is which is right, but at the same time, you can spend as much money as you want on the specification of components. If it's not designed right, they're not going to work anyway. You're going to have to turn it off because it'll be too loud and it'll be inefficient. So the key thing is getting it designed well, getting someone who can give you sound levels before you've installed the system. Pressure loss data is always important. You know that it's being designed properly then if someone can provide you with that information. Um, How do you find a good designer <coughs> or know that they're good at designing? Asking key questions is always good. Can you provide me with sound data at design stage? If they can, that's good. Can you provide me with pressure loss data at design stage? If they can, that's good. And you want someone who's, rather than just going to draw a schematic of some ducting on a piece of paper, you want someone who's going to look at your structure, design it around the structure to make sure when you get it to site, it's actually going to go in. And you can preempt out the number of bends and things that are needed in the design. So again, you can calculate whether the air that you're supplying is actually going to make it all the way along this ducting route to that room at the end of the building. Because sometimes it won't do it. So is this to do with pressure loss? Yeah. What, what is pressure loss? Basically, it's the resistance that the duct is putting in to the airflow through it. So it's the resistance that the duct's providing to the airflow. So let's say you had a duct that was corrugated on the inside or even fluffy on the inside. The air isn't going to flow as freely through that as it would through a completely smooth, say, metal duct. So it's kind of resisting the airflow through it. So... If the pressure loss is too high, 
the fans are working too hard to try and drive the air down that duct. So it's it's nice to have a low pressure loss so the fans are just trickling along. And the second that you start increasing <clears throat> the fan power is when you increase noise as well, would that be it? Yeah, good? yeah, exactly, yeah. It's always good to oversize the unit so it's not running too hard. Again, increasing the pressure, yeah, will drive up the noise levels and the energy consumption. It's kind of similar to when your filters get blocked. If you never change your filters, your fans are going to work harder and harder to drive the air through those filters because they're becoming blocked, so they need to work harder to keep up that airflow. And this ducting, I've got it on my own house, the rigid ducting. <clears throat> what do we need to know about it, and why do you like this type of system? We like the rigid systems because, basically, it's e easy to get a, a low pressure loss with careful sizing of ducts so we can start off with a larger duct in larger houses that might be 160 mil and then you start to branch off there with 125 and 100 mil and a lot of people think that the radial system saves space but if it's done properly instead of having one 100 mil duct say to a bedroom you'd have two 90 mil ducts because those ducts are carrying the same amount of air but they're smaller so there need to be more of them to compensate for that with the steel stuff, with the rigid stuff, it is important to bear it in mind quite early and get the components on site in time. And often a common mistake is for people to get the joists installed and then start trying to put rigid ducting through them, which obviously you can't feed it in. So it's important that any ducts going through the joists are installed as a joist are erected. You mentioned radial versus branch there for a second. So can we stop and look because there's a whole other way of doing it i know that you don't specifically specialize in that but mm. what is radial a good way to look at it is it's always also called an octopus system so you have a main manifold at the start of the system which is just a box with a lot of small spigots on it you'd plug your ra your semi-rigid plastic radial duct in into that and then you'd go off to your rooms so each room had would have its own branch or two or three branches all the way from this manifold at the start of the system all the way to the air valve in the room which is good at preventing any crosstalk sound traveling from room to room because this, the sound can't make it all the way along those ducts so i mean the radial systems do have for uses especially in retrofit cases where you, you simply can't get the rigid stuff in it's it's too big or um it's important to be careful and make sure it's getting designed properly. And I've seen one as well go in at Buckinghamshire Passive House, and it seemed like the commissioning of that was a lot simpler because you do that at the unit. I know we're going to come onto this with um, the branch system, but um, can you explain how you'd commission a radial system? Yeah, I mean, it's it's similar to a rigid system, really. You'd, you'd, you'd tell the unit, what airflow you need it obviously depends on units but a lot of units these days you just tell the unit what airflow you need for the supply what airflow you need for the extract on fan speed one two and three and you'd then set that and you'd go around each air valve in each room measure the airflow coming out of it and check it's right if it's not you'd adjust the airflow so each air valve has a damper built into it you'd adjust that and then go around measure the others and it's kind of a balancing act a lot of to and fro in until you've got the right amount of air going into each space so it's not it's not really self-balancing as such but the the one that i saw i'm going to describe this really badly i should think but they, they were doing it at the system and um popping out little bits of plastic as i said i was going to describe it badly yeah no what that <laughs> is is a uh, what is likely is that they had dampers on each branch to each room so them popping out the plastic was them opening the damper further to allow more airflow along that branch which will in turn take some airflow from another branch so that is a way of commissioning radial systems is doing it via dampers at the beginning of the system I've, i mean the arguments for it i guess you're not having to go to each room running from room to room adjusting things it can all be done there at the unit yeah let's talk about the commissioning because i watched this I imagine Steve from Green Building Store has done this so often that it's a quick process, but I've spoken to other people who say it can take forever to go from room yeah. to room. So explain what you're doing at each specific point and how you're gradually balancing it. 
All right, well, yeah, I mean, you're right. Steve's got it down to a fine art and it definitely keeps him fit running around those big, big London houses. But um, basically, all we're doing, once we've told the unit what it's running at, so if we say to the system we need 300 metres cube per hour on fan speed 2, we then go into, let's say, we're supplying 35 metres cube per hour in a master bedroom. So we'd go into that bedroom. If we're getting 45 metres cube per hour, we'd screw the damper closed more so that you're not getting as much airflow coming through it. The way we measure that airflow is we'd put um, an anemometer over the air valve and that has some kind of hot wires in it that measure how much air is coming out of it. So once we've closed the damper down a bit, we'd take another measurement and hopefully get it to 35. But as we close that damper down, that's driving the air from this air valve into another air valve somewhere else. So we'd then have to go to the next room, see what we're getting out of there. Hopefully now that we've closed the one in the master bedroom, we're getting more air coming out of that one to the right level. If we were then to go into the living room and tweak that air valve, we'd then again have to go back to the master bedroom and check that again, because it's all one system. So if you alter one, it alters all of them. We're going to have a video on that in the hub at some point, but it's probably um, a few months off. Let's talk about those air valves that come out in the different rooms. Why are they different? What what do they do? So the supply valves in, let's again, let's just say in a bedroom, a ceiling-mounted supply valve, it has kind of a plate over the front of it so that the air, rather than just blowing out of the front of the air valve down into the room... It blows across using what's called the Coanda effect, where the air will stick to the ceiling, travel across the room, hit the walls and go down the walls. The extract valves don't have a plate on them because there's no need to, they're only extracting. So they have a damper that kind of screws into the body of the valve. It's important when you design a system to make sure that that valve isn't too far closed because then it'll become clogged up with dust. So it's nice to have it open by a good few millimetres. Similarly with the supply ones, if we if we close that plate on the front, which is the damper, too tight, there's a chance that the air could start whistling out of it, which obviously you don't want in a bedroom. In the kitchen, we'd put a filter in that, in that air valve so that it's not taking any remaining airborne grease and clogging up the system. So we always try and get a filter in there. Now, this is a question that uh, has been on my mind as I look at ours. How easy is it to adjust them if the cleaner's coming round and giving them a quick once-over? Should I be worried? Um, yeah, I mean, they are, they are easy to adjust. What, what should be done after commissioning, once it's complete, the commissioning engineer should lock off the air valves. There's different ways of doing that on different air valves. Most of them, it's quite simple. You just put a, a nut on each end and tighten it up really tight so that, yeah, if you went up and really, really wanted to adjust it, you could do but kids aren't going to be able to adjust it and the cleaner's not going to knock it around with a feather duster. Right, so I have no excuse for all that dust now trying to keep them away from this. <laughs> <laughs> what about the design principles for external vents? One of the good things to look at is trying to get the intake and exhaust ducts on the north elevation, well, particularly the intake. That way it's in a shaded area in, in the peak of the day in summer. So the summer bypass is more more efficient because you're bringing in the cooler, shaded air. It's nice not to have them blow in right next to a window or into a neighbour's garden or somewhere where you might sit in summer and eat your dinner because it is going to be blowing quite hard. It's likely to be audible, even with a silencer. It's still likely to be audible. And you don't want it too close to the ground because if it is too close to the ground, it'll blow up any leaves and debris and animal hairs and the intake duct will then bring that in which fills up blocks up your filters quicker so it's nice to get it above 1.5 meters above the floor level really one of our neighbors had a bonfire uh, that just hung in the air there was no wind at all and we noticed that the house filled up with smoke quite quickly and uh, i did a quick um, what should i do on twitter so you can control these units is it the best idea to just take the flow rate down to absolute minimum if something like that happens if you start to think this is weird yeah maybe, maybe if in that case yeah you could set the unit to unoccupied it'd mean you're getting very little ventilation but but for the time that it takes for that smoke to clear it'd probably be all right 
we have a problem where if someone lives quite rurally, and there's a lot of people with log burners, that that smell becomes permanent rather than just the neighbours having a bonfire. It becomes all through the winter. So um, you can get active carbon filters that will take out that smoke, take out that smell, and filter the air down even better than an F7 filter to make sure there's no or less remaining pollutants in the air. Couple more things then. The actual controls for this, you're always trying to keep them simple. I mean, I, I like it because when someone comes in and says, well, basically just leave it alone. That, that's the control. <laughs> yeah. unless, unless you want more ventilation, you press up. And as you say, if you're not there, you go down to the unoccupied. Yeah, yeah, basically we, we like to keep it as simple as possible. That way... The end user always knows how to use it. There's less to go wrong mechanically. Some people like the intelligent controls, the uh, app on the phone, humidity sensors. But basically, we we say to just leave the unit running on fan speed too, and that'll provide you with enough ventilation. If you leave the house, you could put it on unoccupied, you could set it on fan speed one, but there's no real need to unless you're leaving for a long time because the, the energy consumption shouldn't be t- that high. Maybe if you're cooking or if it's, let's say, Christmas and you've got a lot of people around, you can boost the system, which will increase the ventilation rates for a set time, usually 45 minutes, and then it'll automatically drop back down to fan speed too. The reason we say 45 minutes is because that's, let's say, an average time to cook a meal. The Germans also call it the party button because we use it when the a lot more people around but yeah yeah keep it as basic as as possible really so what are those controls and how many can you have for my house it's just one on the wall but are are there any other options that you have yeah there are so the, the basic thing to do is to put your to have one main controller which you'd put in your kitchen so that when you're cooking you can easily boost the other option is to put that somewhere else and have remote boost switches in your kitchen in some cases you could do it in your bathrooms we wouldn't suggest that because then if someone gets up in the night or early in the morning and boosts the system while showering it can become audible in the bedrooms and disturb those occupants so we design the fan speed 2 floor rates to remove enough moisture while showering without the need to boost other controls a lot of the newer units now you can use uh, get apps on your smartphone or your tablet or you can control it via a web portal which might be a good idea for social housing because you can see from your web portal in the office what the unit's doing, if the pressure loss has gone right up, it's likely that filters need changing or someone's blocked an air valve up. So that would give you a warning then to go out and check that. And maintenance. What do we need to think about? Is it just filters? Yeah, yeah. Providing you keep on top of your filter changes, there should be very little maintenance. So your filters are likely to need changing every three to six months depending on outdoor air quality indoor air quality if you've got a lot of pets or children running around and the other maintenance maybe after five years unscrew the air valves in the bathrooms and have a wipe around in there because they are extracting wet dust and towel lint so that could collect over time and depending on the mvhi unit specified the extract filter may need the extract fan, sorry, may need cleaning very carefully, ideally by someone who's done it before, because it might not be there might not be a filter before that to collect any dust and it hits the fan first rather than the filter first. So that can block up. Got a couple of other little bits and pieces and one is about if things haven't been done well, is there a risk of mold growth in the ducts mold growth in the ducts yeah there is it'd have to be done really badly for that to happen basically if you turn the unit off for a long period of time let's say more than two or three days then there is a chance of mold growing because those ducts are carrying moist air as is the heat exchanger and then yeah if you if your heat exchanger starts to go moldy you're looking at quite a quite a cost to replace it there shouldn't really be any danger of mould growing in the ducts if the system is left on and each branch to each room basically has got air flowing through it. it it's just if the unit's turned off. And one of our hub members has been investigating decentralised MVHR. 
what is that and is it an alternative i think the angle that she's coming from is that she's actually not that keen on all the ducting and is worried about things like mold growth so can you explain a little bit about it and could it have a use in a new build home yeah decentralized is is mbhr but what you'd have in most cases is each room would have its own unit kind of built into an external wall to outside or ducted to outside. The problem is that each room then has has a fan in it, which can create sound problems in that room. A lot of them will say, oh yeah, we're down at 15 decibels. How accurate that is, I don't know. Um, I've never seen one in practice, actually. In new builds, I'd, I'd always suggest to have one central unit. It's less grills on the outside of the building. With decentralised, if you've got four rooms, each with a decentralised unit in, that's four external grills, um, which isn't going to look great. And um, with the cost thing, it's it's unlikely to come out cheaper. So w- with a new build, if you can design the ducting in to the building, which you can at new build stage, then it's worth going for a ducted system. Just thinking about my own system, Alan designed this. We've done a podcast on that that we'll probably link up. But what work do you do once you've got designs from someone like Alan? When we've got them from someone like Alan, there's very little to do. We've worked with Alan a lot in the past, so we know that he he knows what's going on, really. He knows what he's doing. Basically, we just model it in our 3D modelling package, double-check things such as pressure loss and sound levels, we chat to Alan on, on that basis, check he's happy with everything. And then basically we can do a bill of materials then off our model to get a full list of parts, making supply much easier and more efficient. When you've got all these pieces, how competent are the main contractors in doing a good job on site? And is there anything they need to be told? Usually if you've got a, a main contractor who's even building down to passive levels, is very keen and he's got a good attention to detail. So he's quite happy to install an MVHR system with good installation drawings. And if you've got a system where every part is labelled and the parts come to site to suit those drawings, then there's little really that can go wrong. As long as you just stick to those drawings, any amendments that need to be made on site, just communicate them with us so we can check they're going to be all right. And there always will be tweaks that are needed on site because we can sit there in the office and look at the drawings and say, you need to do this and go around that steel. Um, but things always always change on site, don't they? And unexpected things crop up. Self-builders, again, if you've got a self-builder with good, good practical knowledge, they're good installers as well. They pay close attention to it. They know how much work has gone into the design, so they want to do it right. No shortcuts are taken. And finally, is there anything else we should be thinking about or anything else that you don't think we've mentioned that we should just crowbar in at the end? No, I don't think so. Again, there can't be enough stress put on the design stage. It's essential, really. Thinking early on in your building project, what size ducts do I need? Where do I need to run them? What size joists will I need to accommodate these ducts? Even as soon as the architects are engineers start doing the building drawings it's worth then getting your plans submitted to a designer and getting their opinion on unit location and duct sizing so the design is key every time tom thank you very much no problem thank you head online to take a look at the show notes for this one houseplanninghelp.com slash 256 you can review the key points we've got a few diagrams as well to help illustrate what we've been talking about some photos of ducting runs, MVHR installations, and so on. And if you'd like to leave a comment or ask a question, then you can scroll down to the bottom of the show notes. There's a place to do that there. Or get in touch with us on social media. We like to be as responsive as we can. We'll link you to Green Building Store, very good website with all sorts of great information on there, as I think we've said in the last podcast that we did with Chris Herring. Houseplanninghelp.com slash 256 couple of bits of business to finish up with. Firstly, an iTunes review. This is a great way to support the podcast and we thank you if you've written one. It doesn't have to be long. This one's actually quite detailed, which is great. The title is Excellent Website and Podcast for Anyone Interested in Protecting Our World and Environment. And it's from Environmental M. 
I have recently discovered this podcast as we were keen on saving the environment and also considering building our own eco home with a zero carbon footprint. This podcast by Ben has been extremely helpful and I've been listening to almost every episode that has been recorded so far. A few people have done that recently, haven't they? As I play them back to back. Very informative and excellent topics that cover everything from finding a plot to what material to use, how to insulate your existing home or newly built home, etc. Totally recommend it. Ben invites people to his studio that are very knowledgeable in their field and their advice and Ben's specific questions really delve deep into what we need to know to take the next step. Thank you, Ben. Well, thank you, Environmental M. Appreciate that. We love the iTunes reviews. Maybe you're someone who's listened to the back catalogue, or maybe you haven't, and there's lots to dive back to, then I reckon you could probably do the whole thing. I was doing a simple calculation before I recorded this, that five and a half days, no sleep, back-to-back podcast, you just about get there. You'll catch up. So please leave us an iTunes review. It'll help others find the podcast too. And finally, my call to action is to check out The Hub. This is our resource where we try to deliver more value. We've got the podcast and then we think, well, hold on, how can we go to the next level? And that's what we're trying to do here. Useful digital tools, mainly video. It's what we like because we do audio on the podcast. So we try to make sure that there's some really good videos in there. I obviously run a production company called Regen Media. Video, even for me, is expensive to produce, but I think it's worth it because no one is doing this. So we want to do something that no one's doing. We've covered three builds so far. We're turning around some of the stories and the lessons from my own project at the moment. So that's our in-depth video case studies. We've got the courses, which lay out step by step what you need to be doing if you're ever stuck and thinking, what should I do next? Then hopefully we've got it covered there in the courses. We've got our conference calls, which is a live training session that we hold once a month just to vary the learning and to keep us all interactive and there's another place that we do that in the forum that's where you can get your questions answered as well houseplanninghelp.com slash join i'd love you to check it out you know we say stay a member as long as you feel you're getting value we try to deliver that value but month 10 months 10 years i don't care just come and check it out is the main thing houseplanninghelp.com slash join There we go. Thanks for listening. The House Planning Help podcast is produced by Regen Media, content that matters.